From the Evening Standard in London, this is The Leader. Hi, I'm David Marsland. There is no Brexit on October 31st, and the only people taking to the streets are kids in fancy dress for Halloween. The Prime Minister staked his reputation, indeed his political life, if you want to be dramatic, on a do-or-die departure. Nobody died, and looking at the results of an Evening Standard poll, nobody cared. Interestingly, there's no real sign of damage for him missing that deadline in this poll. 84% of Tories, that's a record number, saying they're happy with the job he's doing of handling Brexit. Our political editor Joe Murphy on the survey showing a huge election lead for the Conservatives that makes scary reading for Labour. Also... So you've got models of um, stately homes and palaces on the floor, hand-coloured prints and pictures of um, various historical figures on the wall. The incredible secret museum created by an ordinary man in an ordinary London house and the campaign to save it. Taken from the Evening Standard's editorial column, this is The Leader. For the whole thing, pick up the newspaper or head to standard.co.uk slash comment. In a moment, the first major poll of the election campaign shows a huge lead for the Conservatives. In an alternate reality, the UK left the European Union as planned at 11.01, just before the witching hour on October 31st. Maybe there was a party, maybe there was a riot, maybe both. But we live in this reality, and here, nothing. Including, according to an Evening Standard poll, apparently any consequence. Here's our editorial column. We aren't leaving the European Union. We aren't about to suffer no deal. We aren't being issued with commemorative 50 pence coins, and this morning the M20 through Kent was running smoothly, rather than preparing to become the world's longest lorry park. And then there's something else that hasn't happened as well. The collapse of support for the Conservative Party for failing to do what it promised. Instead, as our poll today shows, it has a 17-point lead over Labour, with the Prime Minister's personal approval ratings climbing, even as respect for Jeremy Corbyn falls further. For now, Mr Johnson will be happy, and Mr Corbyn should be scared. Well, our political editor, Joe Murphy, has been going through the figures from our poll in the Evening Standard's Westminster office. Joe, we've only just started the election campaigns, but Labour has a mountain to climb. They have got a huge mountain to climb, and a lot of that mountain is overcoming the impression among the public that Jeremy Corbyn isn't doing a good job. And over half of their own supporters, just over half, think that he is doing a bad job when it comes to Brexit, which is going to be a big part of this campaign. And pretty well half think are dissatisfied with his performance in general. So when Jeremy Corbyn was today talking about how the election is not about me, it sort of is, isn't it? Well, this was in his Battersea rally. It's the kick-off of the campaign. And uh, he said... It's not about me. It's not about any individual on this platform. It's not a presidential election. (laughs) The irony, of course, is that this was in a hall where he was given the full presidential treatment with an ecstatic crowd of of supporters only um, cheering him and chanting along with him, um, just as though it was at a presidential rally in America, to be honest. Now, compare that with Boris Johnson, and at least among Conservative supporters, they seem extremely satisfied with him. You've got eight out of ten Conservatives happy with their leader, a big contrast with Labour supporters, and you've got 84% saying he's doing a good job at handling Brexit, which is higher than Mrs May achieved at any time, even in, in that rather bogus heyday before the 2017 election. And that's despite the fact that we're supposed to leave the EU today. Well, of course, I'm incredibly frustrated uh, that we're not able to uh, get Brexit done today, but let's be no doubt what's happened. We had a fantastic deal on the table. The House of Commons uh, voted it through, but then they voted again for delay. Interestingly, there's no real sign of damage um, for him missing that deadline in this poll. You've got 47% of the 
public saying he's done a good job at handling Brexit, which is an increase from a month ago when it was 38. And you've got 84% of Tories, that's a record number, saying they're happy with the job he's doing of handling Brexit. Um, on the subject of the deadline, well, people don't entirely blame the Prime Minister. They're more likely to blame Parliament, the Speaker, opposition groups or Jeremy Corbyn if they're unhappy with the delay. Those who are happy with the delay, ironically, don't give Jeremy Corbyn much credit for that. They, again, say it's down to MPs in Parliament. Is there any way for the Liberal Democrats, uh, maybe even the Brexit Party, to eat into the Conservative vote right now? Well, the Brexit Party seems to be having huge problems of its own today because they are clearly split over whether to field 600 candidates and fight the Tories everywhere or whether to just try and fight a limited campaign for, say, 20 winnable seats. Um, the Liberal Democrats, their poll rating has gone down slightly and Joe Swinson's satisfaction scores are, are treading water, to be honest, um, quite a few don't knows there. I would say that the really thing, real thing to watch out for is, in places like London especially, the Lib Dems will get a higher vote than they got last time by a big margin because of Brexit. And even if they don't win seats outright, they will make a heck of a difference in a lot of contests around the country, but especially in London. They're going to take votes off Labour, they're going to take votes off the Conservatives. And there's a big question. Take a seat like Putney, where Justine Greening is retiring. Will the Lib Dem effect there um, be to win outright? I'm sure Joe Swinson would like to think that. But more, more than likely, the effect will be to increase a Conservative majority or hand the seat to Labour. On the basis of this poll, if, it can t if the vote was tomorrow, it doesn't look like there would be any chance of a coalition government, though, does it? There would be quite a significant Conservative majority. On the basis of this poll, you're looking at um, a, a long Conservative lead on polling day, and you'd expect a Conservative majority. But the polls need to be taken with a big pinch of salt in this election. First of all, the electorate are flying off in all sorts of directions. The old two-party system, which is what made which is what made polls predictable and swingometers work, they, it's all stopped working. It's fallen apart. So there could be some huge surprises. You might find that this lead vanishes, or you might find that this lead simply doesn't translate into gains in seats. You might find the Tories gain some seats up north in leave areas that Labour used to used to take for granted. And you might find the Tories at the same time losing more seats in the South and in London, where they're under threat in several places, and ending up in a similar position to Mrs May. Next. Unless you were actually to replicate the uh, flat itself and the garden, I think it would be very difficult to make it work. When the occupant of an unassuming apartment in Notting Hill died, he left behind an extraordinary collection of his own art, now the owners of that building want to clear it out and move someone else in. Why we think they should leave it alone. On a very quiet day, my first ever editor once handed me a tape recorder, it was a long time ago, and kicked me out of the office shouting, there's a story behind every door, go and get one. I think I came back with a vox pop about parking charges, but how I wish I'd found the door to Jerry Dalton's apartment in Notting Hill, where, as our editorial explains, the most incredible story has been hiding all this time. Jerry's Pompeii is a one-bedroom apartment in a house in Westbourne Park, where an Irishman, Gerald Dalton, devoted more than 30 years to creating models of stately homes and castles and his idiosyncratic clay figures of various notables. Some of them form a startling waterfront feature on the Grand Union Canal. He died this year and his admirers, including artists and museum directors, have written to the Genesis Notting Hill Housing Trust to ask that they allow a grace period of three to six months before disposing of the property. During that time, they can decide how to preserve the collection, perhaps if the needs of the neighbours are met, by buying the apartment and creating a community museum. This is a modest ask, 
and the trust should say yes. Creating a fantastical kingdom out of a one-bedroom London flat is a feat that deserves reward. We're now joined by our arts and features writer Melanie McDonough. Melanie, you've been in the house. What's it like? It is very, very weird because it looks like a completely unprepossessing um, the house from the outside. You go into a nondescript sort of wallpapered hall and then when you turn into the actual apartment from the communal hall, you end up with this extraordinary collection of what looks like jumble. So you've got models of um, stately homes and palaces on the floor, hand-coloured um, prints and pictures of um, various historical figures on the wall. And on the shelves, you've got uh, busts of composers or of Queen Victoria or of tra- um, little statues of Charlie Chaplin. All highly coloured and, um, uh, I mean, some of it absolute hat. But as a combination of things, it does create the most extraordinary impression. Um, that is um, a combination of, as I say, things that he's uh, bought and brought together and things that he's actually made. In the whole, you find a lot of pictures, which are scenes, again, of um, historical figures or personages like the Pope or a battle scene, and they're all brought together and um, with little labels that he's made himself. So he took the trouble to label and describe all these people. And the kitchen has a little miniature mausoleum, what he called a tomb house, with little tiny effigies of various individuals and little portraits on the walls. It is the most extraordinary place, and that's just the inside. And then when you get outside, you've got row after row of these very odd little clay figures. I think they're all taken from a common mould. In fact, they must be. Uh, Those are the male figures. And um, they've all got grey faces, red-rimmed eyes, wigs painted black. They're of various historical figures, like Stuart King's or... Um, Oliver Cromwell. And then the figures go right down to the canal front. He took over the little patch, uh, which wasn't actually his, um, between his uh, wall and the canal, and he put another row of these little figures, all painted up and all described, and interesting bits of tiles. The neighbours speak about seeing him in the front, uh, sort of um, raking the garden, the little patch in front of his house, or sweeping it. And um, they all speak of him with affection as um, a quiet very modest man. What do we know about the artist himself? Because he seems to have been not known for being an artist during his lifetime. Well, he wasn't an artist. Uh, he was born in 1934, came to England in 1959. He came from Athlone, and um, he'd worked when he was a young man for an English colonel and his wife um, near Athlone, and then came to London. And he was plainly a bit of a monarchist, which a lot of Irish were. And um, when he had uh, leisure, which he did when he retired, um, when he was 60, which is quite early, I suppose, uh, he um, just set about creating this little world inside his own apartment. And he was just assembling the kind of things that pleased him and making the kind of things that pleased him. Obviously, he's living there alone and filling his house with all all of these statues. I yes. wonder if he was kind of keeping himself company. Well, what he actually said in the transcript of an interview that he gave, not, I think, that long before he died, is that he, it kept him off the streets, that he didn't have the diversions that um, people do now in the way of um, television, and certainly not in the distractions that we have. And I imagine that um, he must have been um, a little lonely by himself. And um, this was a man who liked a hobby. It's one of those remarkable kind of secret London stories, isn't it? Because yes. there's not really much of an I know that our own editor, George Osborne, had walked yeah. past it and seen these statues and wondered what was going on. But you've no idea from yeah. the outside of what's in there, do you? Is it quite exciting when you open that door and go, what, 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 what are we going to get here? It's very hard not to be won over um, by the just engaging doll's house quality of the whole thing. Some of the figures have that slightly bizarre and slightly um, spectral quality of the uh, figures we get for the Day of the Dead in Mexico. And um, they're completely idiosyncratic and of a kind. But the word has got out. I understand they've been running tours yes. in, in the house. And are they popular? Some very distinguished people actually have joined the list of supporters. You've got um, a number of museum directors, for instance, like um, Tristram Hunt and the Arts Council head Nicholas Sorota have um, both um, joined the list of people who are behind the campaign. 
going to try and preserve the collection in some way. So it may be, if the neighbours were agreeable, and if there's some way of doing it without disturbing them, that they might be able to turn it into a community museum uh, so people could have timed access to it in small groups, visits by appointment um, for, I would have thought, a relatively small admission charge um, that conducted with an individual conducting the little tour. I guess it's one of those collections that kind of has to stay in situ, doesn't mm. it? You could take those out and put them into a museum, yeah. but you wouldn't get that the same effect. Yeah, exactly. Unless you were actually to replicate the uh, flat itself and the garden. And I can't quite see how you would do that unless you had quite enormous space in a museum. Um, I think it would be very difficult to make it work because um, the, the little cramped hall, for instance, with all the uh, jumble of um, pictures on the walls, that would be very hard to recreate in any other space. Do we know if the Housing Association is minded to to keep things there or are they quite determined that they, they want this house back and it, it could go to yeah. somebody who needs a house? Of course, yes. And um, they haven't so far um, said that they'll allow this um, period of grace between three to six months. They've um, suggested that the supporters come up with the um, funding up front um, in short order which, when it's worth half a million, um, really is um, a very tall order. So I think it's a reasonable request that the supporters are making that they simply be given this grace period of up to half a year in order to decide how best to present it. And that's the leader. Now, having written that nothing's going to happen overnight, you can bet that something will. Whatever occurs, there's a a 7am morning bulletin available through your smart speaker. Just ask for the news from the Evening Standard. The leader is back tomorrow at 4.00.